Now here's Ed Bernstein. Hey, welcome. It's a uh, summer lull, but not for the people at the Clark County School District. And with me is Superintendent Pat Starkowski. And uh, we were just talking uh, when we were watching the introduction about how busy you are. We have, what, the fourth or fifth largest uh, school district in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, sometimes it's overwhelming to, to think about the, uh, how you really run that. Well, um, being the fifth largest school district in the nation um, and growing still, it is a challenge because you are constantly having to look forward. And so we started planning for the new school year back in, in April and, and before the, the last school year was closed. So it is a challenge trying to stay up on top of things and, and it's constantly moving. No downtime. Yeah. And our, our enrollment is, is up this year. Yes. We ended the year um, with 316,000 students. We anticipate that by the um, end of September, we're going to be at 320,000 students, another 4,000 students coming into the district. And these are brand new to the Clark County School District. Now, obviously, this is linked directly to people moving back into Las Vegas. For a while, we were losing uh, population, or it was, it was flat. Now, mm -hmm. we're, it's, it's changed. That is true. And we are seeing that enrollment at the elementary level. So again, it's, it's younger families who are moving here and, and bringing their kids with them because the work is coming back. And so it's a good positive economic indicator sign, but I will tell you it's, it's a big challenge for us in the Clark County School District. That's the area where we have the least capacity when it comes to seats in our schools. Yeah, and, and look, you've, you've been dealing a lot with uh, budget issues and financial matters and revenue and that, and, and that type of thing. I mean, it's got to be the hardest part of, of, of the job. Um, the, and it's almost like a, a, a can't win type of situation. You have to, you know, get money from the, what, from the legislature, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and then you have to be accountable to how it's spent. And you're known for being a very transparent um, administrator, uh, which to me implies that in the past it hasn't really been that way. Um, I, I think our focus, if we are going to do more or ask for more, you have to be very clear about what you've got and what you're using it for. And so I'm working very closely with a group of business individuals from across the community who basically have opened up the budget to them and said, okay, let's really look at how we're spending our money. Can you find us better ways to do business? And can we then turn around and repurpose that money back into the classroom to help support the teachers? And has that been helpful or good ideas coming out of that, uh, that group? We're focusing on um, evaluation of programs and looking at our programs that we spend money on and saying, okay, is this program working? What criteria would we use to develop whether there's a good return on investment or a good value for that? And if there's not, then we eliminate those programs and can reuse that money in other places. We're looking at our own internal departments and divisions to see if they are functioning effectively and, and at the point where where we are using money wisely. And then we are also looking at, which is probably the most difficult, but the most exciting piece, is to look at the money that goes into a school, all the federal money, the, the district money, the general, general money special ed, how is it tied to student achievement of that school? And are there schools who get um, the least amount of money but are doing extremely well? Are there schools that get a lot of money and are doing well? Or are there schools that get a lot of money and are not doing so good? So what do we need to fix to, to make sure we're getting that return on investment? You know, typically when, a, uh, when an entity is doing this type of review, you know, they, historically what they do is they bring a committee in or they do a study, and, you know, they're not really interested in, in changing. But I really get the feeling <laughs> that, um, that you are um, open to ideas and to, to innovations. We, um, over the past two years, I've, I've eliminated um, almost $9 million in contracts of things that, you know, either we could do better or that we didn't need to be spending that money because it wasn't being utilized effectively. So, so I am all about looking at where we can cut and repurpose that money to help support the kids in the classroom. I mean, so you have, what, 320,000 students. So, I mean, that world also involves parents yes. and teachers. And sure. when you add that all together, you're probably, you know, somewhere close to a million um, total um, lives that, that are affected by the Clark County School District. 
And, you know, when you think about uh, what your job is and how you have to balance, you have to feed, you have to house, you have to educate. Um, it, it's, it's, and it, you're one person. I mean, it's like you're running a city, but you don't have a city council to help you. We, um, we're the third largest employer in the state with 39,000 employees, both full and part-time. And then you look at the families and lives that are impacted with just those employees, and that number goes up significantly. And then you look at the, the, the students and their families. So yes, it is a challenge. You know, education has changed quite a bit since you and I were in the classroom um, as students. And we have to look at the social service, the wraparound services piece as well, and how do we provide that? We rely on our community partners to help us with that. Um, and so we, we have to understand that if a child is hungry or is worried about where they're going to sleep that night or worried about how their parents are going to get home so that they can have somebody at home with them when they get home from school, they're not going to focus on school in the classroom. So we have to eliminate those, those barriers and help that student relax and be able to focus on learning. Did you ever anticipate that you'd be a, a superintendent? I know you started as a, as a teacher. No. <laughs> I mean, you, you thought your career would Honestly, just be teaching, be in the um, classroom your, your entire career. I, I had aspirations yeah. to be a principal. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, sometimes your, your path takes you in places that you didn't ever think you were going to be in. And, and I think that um, what I've realized is that if I can positively impact a larger number of kids and, and help make sure that they get the education that they're not only entitled to but deserve, then then that's great. Um, if you had asked me two years ago at this point in time when mm -hmm. I was just now starting the deputy superintendent role that, that in two years you'd be the superintendent, I would have said you're crazy. <laughs> you thought you have a longer tra training period. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But how is it uh, different? Um, I mean, when you're a, t a teacher, I mean, the, no. the payback to, um, to a, a career for a teacher is that you can really, you know, see the impact you're making on a student or a group of students. Um, it, it's interesting. Um, you see it for that year. You don't always see it for the future. You don't mm -hmm. always know that what you have done has made an impact. Um, I will tell you, um, three weeks ago, I had a phone call, and it was a former student who wanted to come in and visit one of my fifth graders from when I was teaching fifth grade, and literally sat down and talked to me. We sat for almost an hour, mm -hmm. talked. He was able to remember things that had happened in the classroom, activities that we had done, things that we had worked on. He was able to talk about how his education had shaped him um, in that year. And so that gives me that energy to say, you know what, I need to create that environment for every student in every classroom. It's amazing what we re recall from our school sure. days. You didn't grow up in Las Vegas. You went, you no. went to college, what, Oklahoma? Oklahoma State, yeah. uh-huh. So what brought you to Las Vegas? A job. Um, the uh, job industry for teachers in Oklahoma, the pay was so low. And, and so I decided um, that I needed to branch out. And so I interviewed with 10 districts from across mm -hmm. the nation, had job offers at all 10, found this one to be the one where the cost of living was good, you know, the tax structure was good, and, and took a leap. But the interesting thing is I'd never been to Las Vegas. I'd been in a layover in an airport <laughs> once, <laughs> yeah. but I'd never been to Las Vegas. And I moved, uh, flew in on Sunday, and literally started teaching Monday morning. So you must have had preconceived ideas of oh, what sure. Las Vegas was like. So when you got here, was, was there a dissidence in that? Um, well, yes, definitely. Uh, I think when I was a student teacher, my master teacher said, they have schools in Las Vegas? <laughs> that was the response. And I think that that's, um, that's the perception that's out there across the valley. They see the strip. I was recently at a conference, um, and it was 17 other large urban school districts. And they had, we had to give one interesting fact. And um, the interesting fact that I said is, when you look at the Las Vegas strip, and within a mile on either side, we have 10 elementary, middle, and high schools that you can see from those windows that mm -hmm. people have no idea are right there in the backyards. Mm -hmm. And some of them are our mo most challenging schools. And there's a lot of things there. Yeah, there are. <laughs> there uh, are. So, so you became a teacher in, um, mm -hmm. in Clark County. And then after a number of years, um, you became an assistant principal or a principal? Right. Um, seven and a half years in the right. classroom, three and a half at um, first grade, uh, four at fifth grade. And then I became an elementary assistant principal, and I was assigned mm -hmm. to uh, two schools for a year and a half, another school for six months, and then I became an elementary principal. So how, how does that work? Is there is, there's an opening and you apply? Or 
At the time, you didn't apply. At the time, you got onto into a qualified selection pool, mm -hmm. and then the powers that be just decided, okay, you're going to be appointed, and here's where you're going to go. And so in those days, you didn't have any choice. They called you up after the board meeting and said, you were appointed, and you're going to go to such and such school, and you need to be there on Monday morning. So, after be, after, so then you ultimately became a principal. I did. Which was your career goal. It was. So, I mean... Uh, that experience is significantly different than one of being a teacher. Correct. Um, but I still, I, and I think that this is part of my mindset today, is that I never forgot what it was like to be in the classroom. I never forgot what the day-to-day -day teacher has to deal with, the day-to-day -day routines, all the structures, and how much pressure and stress there is on those teachers in the classroom. And so as I was a principal, I kept that in mind and said, okay, what can I take off their plate? What do I need to have them do that's going to help them be successful? Mm -hmm. And what supports can I give them? Um, as I moved up in these positions, it became the same mindset. Don't forget the classroom. Don't forget what that teacher goes through every day. And don't forget the challenges that those kids and the teachers face. Now, when you're a principal of a school, you're there every mm -hmm. day. So you are still interacting mm -hmm. with the students, you're still interacting with the teachers. And then you went over to the Actually, to the to the administrative central office side. side. Central, uh -huh. Is that what it's called? Central, central office. office. Sounds like a CIA. Yeah, or exactly. <laughs> and and, um, and so you're kind of removed from that environment there. So how do you stay in touch with that? Um, I was in schools every day as a supervisor. Mm -hmm. Different schools every day. Sometimes two or three schools every day, just depending upon the day and the structure. Uh, you are in there to support the principal. You're there to walk the building with the assistant principals and the deans and and see what's going on. You deal with the parent concerns. You deal with um, assisting with the needs of the schools, and, and you're there to support. And so you shift from being that leader in the school to a support personnel. You have to hold them accountable. You give them direction. Mm -hmm. You hold them accountable, but you're there to support and help them get there. And now as a, the school superintendent, I mean, you, you were the um, – uh, we had a, a, a school super – I forgot already who it was. Um, uh, Dwight Jones. Lesson, Dwight Jones. Sorry. Yes. And, um, and he resigned mm -hmm. suddenly, and then uh, there was a search uh, performed, and, um, and they, we looked in our own backyard and, and found what we felt to be the most qualified candidate. Right, and, it, and actually, they didn't actually ever follow through with the search, mm -hmm. because as they were talking about the search, um, they, the public and, and the trustees realized then that, you know, at that point in time, that this was the person that we wanted. And so, um, they told me to get ready for an interview, and they asked me how long it would take to prepare. Mm -hmm. And um, we were sitting at a board meeting, and I said, if I can't answer the questions now, then I'm not your person. And so they interviewed me for three hours after that. So I went up to the table, and they just grilled me with the questions. It seems that politics is a necessary evil in, in your job. You have the, uh, the school board you mm -hmm. deal with. You have uh, the state legislature and even uh, the federal government. Mm -hmm as well as the county commission, right? right. I mean, you deal with all, all these city, county entities. entities because we cover the entire county. Right, so, so it would be better off removing the politics out of, um, out of education? Well, I think it would be an easier job, that's for yeah. sure. Um, if I could just focus on that piece and what we need to do. I will tell you that um, you know, sometimes the politics can, can help you, and so you have to get that mm -hmm. balance of, of helping and, and thriving and make sure that you're the one that's moving the district forward. But I will tell you, I work with seven amazing trustees. Each one of them has different skills. Um, they bring something different to the table. They are, are becoming our trusted leaders in the sense that they are developing areas of expertise where they are working with us and helping us move it forward. So they become the spokesperson, and it's not just me out there. They're learning that, you know, I get out and I can talk about this with my constituents. I can talk about, okay, now I was in the room when this decision was made, and here's, here's why it was made. I, we have some incredible programs at the Clark County School District, and you and I have spoken about some mm -hmm. of them in the past, but it seems that that when you read about the school district uh, or you hear about it on the news, it's always, you know, the somebody complaining about sure. something. I mean, it, it, it seems like the positive never, uh, never really um, is identified. I, I, we face that battle yeah. on a daily basis. When you look 
um, we believe that we're going to have the largest graduating class. You know, and we're still cleaning up numbers, and we've got students who just took um, proficiency tests who are going to get their results next week. Um, we believe we're going to have the largest number of students graduating uh, that we've ever had. We had, I, I sat and I went to 17 high school graduations personally this year. Mm -hmm. It was a road trip, I'll tell you, just <laughs> spending time there and shaking lots of hands. But what I kept hearing was, kids going to Stanford, to Harvard, to Yale, to Princeton, to um, Academy appointments, to the Air Force Academy, the Naval Academy, uh, to West Point. Um, Ivy League schools, top name schools on the West Coast, um, uh, uh, military appointments, and I just sat there and I was overwhelmed with this sense of pride, and I'm like, why can't this be the story right, right now? Why can't this? We focused in May on a graduate a day, and we took the kids that um, schools nominated a graduate, and they didn't have to be their top graduate. And actually, we we wanted students that struggled through and graduated high school, or ones that were doing unique things as they went through high school. We have a website now that really focuses on those graduate a day, and you can go in and and see these kids' stories and and see some of the adversity that they went through to get that high school diploma and and it happens all over our district all over our district and so that's the the challenge is how do you get the positive noise is what we call it the positive noise through the negative stuff that's all out there yeah and it seems like always you know the the number one issue with education is is money you know uh, where sure. to get it how to spend it um, you've done a tremendous job of you know of uh, fine-tuning how to spend it uh, where to get it is still, I guess, an open question. It is. Right? There's some, some, some uh, um, votes, I guess, coming up. But what, sure. are, what, what exactly is that, though? Um, well, the margins, the margins tax, the education initiative, um, would actually have the an additional tax that would get money for specifically schools. Now, I will tell you, um, opponents and proponents have different ways of, of spinning their story. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to understand the, the true issues that are here. Um, the challenge for us is, is that we know we need more money. I'm not sure where the best way to get it is, um, but we have to figure out a way to do that. The community has to pull together and say, this is the way that we're going to get more money for education. We are the lowest funded when it comes to per pupil expenditures in the nation. And when you look at what we spend, what we get, and what we spend per student, and then you put that with the achievement gains that we have been able to make over the last few years, we're doing more with less. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon it's just going to be less with less, though, if we don't get some, some money to help us move it forward. And some of that is infrastructure, isn't it? Correct. Our capital program is, is at an end. Um, we have um, just a little bit of that billion dollar bond that is left over. Um, we have no bond in sight at this point in time. We have aging structures. We have schools that are 50, 60 years old that um, it's like the casino on the strip. You know, when, when the big casinos were there, to go in and retrofit some of those schools, it would actually cost more to retro, retrofit it than it would to be build it from and scratch it, up yeah. to code. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so we have to balance that. Um, we have to look at the growing number of, of students coming in at the elementary level specifically. Um, we are 17.9% over capacity, over our elementary seat capacity at the elementary level. So where portables are coming in, they're going onto campuses, we're going to have to make some very tough decisions here very quickly about how we are going to address this overcrowding issue. And part of that is uh, our year-round schools yes. uh, consideration as well. Yes. And how do they seem to work? Is um, it net positive or negative? I, I would say I taught as a year-round teacher and then was an assistant principal in a year-round school. I think that there are pros and cons to it. Uh, once families get used to the structure, I will tell you some families love it. You know, families that, you know, are, need to go on ski vacations or, or want to go on ski vacations or just even make a trip down to Disneyland. Now don't, kids don't have to miss school to do it during mm -hmm. the school year. Um, it is a challenge when it comes to the number of days tested, though, because certain schedules of those kids don't have as many days of instruction before they have to get tested, so that's a challenge. But we haven't seen any specific achievement increases or decreases with the year-round schools. It, they mm -hmm. perform pretty pretty much as the nine months did. When, when you look at uh, the education system in other countries, it mm -hmm. seems like uh, their days are getting longer. Yeah. They're getting packing more education into each mm -hmm. day, and it seems, uh, we're get, are we going the other way? We are at a six hour and 11 minute day for our students, right. which is one of the shortest in the nation and definitely one of the shortest in the world. Um, the challenge, um, you know, I was 
in China a couple of years ago. I went over with Green Valley High School's band as part of the Shanghai Tourism Festival. Um, but while I was there, I spent a day in schools in Shanghai so that I could kind of learn and see what they're doing. Uh, their kids are in school nine hours a day. Um, there are teachers, the way that their teacher schedule is, they have a common planning time where they literally plan lessons for the rest of, of the week together. They plan on a daily basis. So, so they are constantly looking at where their students are performing, mapping out what instruction needs to take place, and, and they have the time to be able to go into the depth that we don't have because they have that longer day. How, how do you balance um, you know, that longer time period in classroom with with the potential for um, uh, for utilizing technology to you know to mm -hmm. accompany it, we are actually we're moving now right now into blended more blended classrooms and more online experiences. We have about thirty thousand students who are in an online class right now. We're trying to increase that over the next three years to a hundred thousand students. That means that they're not in an online school, but they're at least taking one online course. So you do that at home? Or they do, do it at home. During the school um, day. They can do it during the school day, depending upon the situation. Some of our schools can't offer um, advanced placement calculus. And so we have an advanced placement calculus virtual course that those students then participate in online. And so they're able to get that credit, that course that their school doesn't mm -hmm. offer. And we actually open that up to the rest of the state. Is this a, a Clark County uh, um, course, or is it something that, that is a national class that, that gets certified that you approve? It is actual. Our curriculum has actually been certified as online curriculum, so mm -hmm. we have actually won awards for our online curriculum. Um, it is based upon the Nevada Academic Content Standards, and the instructional methods that are utilized are, are the best when it comes to that online learning experience. But now we're doing some more blended learning experiences where we flip the classrooms. Um, in some situations where students, we have devices that go home with students, the teacher may teach their lesson and video record it so it becomes a podcast. Uh -huh. They do that. The kid goes home, takes their computer home, and watches the lesson at home, does a little practice there. And then when they come back, the teacher does a quick review and then is able to get in and work with the kids on the actual using the skill and mastering the skill. So that's happening in some of our classrooms now, and we're seeing some good success with that. I love it. No more notes? You we know. <laughs> you could, and you can watch yeah. the podcast. Is, let's say yeah. that you didn't understand it and you got into class right. the next day and you still have struggled. You go back and watch the podcast again. You can watch it anytime. When you're reviewing for a test, you watch that podcast and it helps you remember how to do that. So now we have it permanently for those kids to be able to use. Love it. In, in addition to, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, having conflicting opinions on, uh, on, uh, on budget, it seems the other big area is testing. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has an opinion on sure. testing. How do, you, how do you measure? How do you measure success? I mean, have you figured out a formula for that yet? <laughs> I wish I had because I, I could then open up a company and, <laughs> yeah. and make some money. Um, the entire nation is struggling with this. When you look at um, our tests that we currently use in Nevada this year are not consistent with the tests in any other state in, in the country. And so we can never compare ourselves truly on any assessment. Mm -hmm. um, we are moving to that. Uh, the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium is a group of 23 states that they're developing a test for. So it would be third through eighth graders that all the kids would take the exact same test. So then we would be able to see that. Problem is, is that's an online assessment. Do all of our districts in the state and all the districts in those 23 states, do they have the infrastructure and the devices to be able to do that online assessment within the time frame? A little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So the bandwidth just that, that is needed alone to run that many devices at the same time in a school is a challenge. And so right now, I was talking with the state superintendent yesterday, you know, some of our districts are struggling with that bandwidth issue while others struggle with the number of devices to have enough for kids to be able to, yeah. to use. So there's no silver bullet when it comes to assessment right now. Um, my fear is that we tend to assess too much and not um, have enough time for instruction. So one of the things that we're doing with our assessment is we're putting together a balanced assessment program to say, these are what you have to do, and you do not get to go over that too much to, to determine how kids are doing. Because you have these kids that will take, you know, 10 different assessments in a, in a month or two month time period. 
They know exactly what skills they're missing, but when does the teacher have time to teach them? So we've got to figure that out. Yeah, and, and how, and, I mean, how accurate is a, a right. test anyway? I right. mean, it, it has its own limits of, of what it really is measuring, any more, any more than a uh, SAT or an LSAT or an IQ test will measure. Right. You actually, you know, it measures what you're specifically looking for in the test, but it doesn't measure it at any depth. What we found is, is that, you know, multiple choice questions, they are basically low level application of skills, very, very low level. Right. So you really can't determine how well a student knows the material until they actually have to apply those strategies and skills in some sort of problem situation. The testing environment is moving towards those types of situations where the kids are having to manipulate problems on the device. So if you're going to give them a math problem, then they have to go through and, and put down the steps of how they're going to solve it. They may not lose full points because they got the answer wrong if they, they followed steps and you were able to see that. So it goes back to that partial credit piece as to if they have a basic understanding but made a calculation error, that's one way to, to look at it. In, in, in the past, I know that we've, uh, this time of the year is, is when we recruit new teachers, yes. and in the past that we've had uh, a shortage of teachers. Uh, how are we doing this year in trying to attract uh, new staff? It is, um, we are attracting, we are actually trying to hire another 2,000 new teachers. Uh, some of that is based on attrition. Um, we do have some baby boomers, yeah, 2,000 again. Mm -hmm. um, we have some baby boomers who are um, retiring now, mm -hmm. and so we're seeing some, some higher numbers retire. Um, and then we have the growth factor, so we're doing that. Um, I would say we are about um, three-fourths of the way there. We've got a big push in August. We've still got a ways to go, though. And we're we, going to have we to really push. 30 seconds left. What's the most important thing a parent um, can do to, to be involved with, with the school district? Um, I think, one, they need to go to the school. Two, we've got back-to-school fairs that are coming up. So if they have any questions, those are going to be in August at the Meadows Mall, the Boulevard Mall, the Galleria Mall. Um, contact the school. Contact the main district offices at, at 799-5000 if they have questions. And, and make sure that they're working with the kids every night. Just reading is all I need them to do. Thank Read you with their kids. So much, Superintendent Pat Skorakowski. Keep, so keep, keep up the good work. Thank Doing you a great so much. Job. Appreciate Thank it. You. See you next week.